Hej, välkommen till uh, Dokument uh, intervjuer. I dag så är er jag så heldig att få snacka med, med James Lindsay som är er en uh, amerikansk uh, författare. James är er kanske känd för många av dere, men uh, för dere som inte känner ham så kan jag fortælle att James först blev känd som en del av The Grievance Studies hoax där han och Peter Bogosian och Helen Pluckers dokumenterade hur rottent akademia har blivit ved att producera artiklar med helt bizarre temaer som våldtäktskultur bland hunder och en omskrivning av ett kapitel fra Mein Kampf med feministisk fri. Poenget deres var att akademia är er fullständig wokeifierat av postmodernistisk identitetspolitik. Senere har det gått slag i slag for James. James er matematiker, men har fordypet sig i det han kallar kritisk social rettferdighet. Og har skrevet en rekke bøker de siste årene, blant annet Race Marxism, The Truth About Critical Race Theory and Praxis, og The Queering of the American Child med Logan Lansing. Den sista boken handler om hvordan skjev teori har infiltrert kulturen og skoleverket i USA, og er også veldig relevant for et norsk publikum. James har også varit gäst på Joe Rogan flere ganger, og gjestet podcaster som Jordan Petersons, i tillegg til å reise rundt og holde tale for konservative grupper i USA. Han driver også nettstedet New Discourses, som fungerer som et oppslagsverk for woke ideer. I 2019 så møtte jeg James på en konferens i London som handlet om kritisk social rettferdighet, eller Critical Social Justice, um, den gången hade jag skrivit någon artikel för Quillet om uh, hvordan aktivister i strikkemiljö eh uh, började och kansellera varandra. Um, så det var min introduktion till James. Så det är er väldigt hyggligt att ha han här idag. Um, so James it's an honor to talk to you today. We first met back in 2019 when wokeness or critical social justice was only just starting to trickle into the mainstream. Uh, It feels like a lot has happened since then. Back then, we saw how certain communities fell into the arms of activists who claimed they were doing good things, but actually inflicted a lot of harm and anguish on people for not towing the line, and the beginning of cancel culture was born. Um, I documented this myself in the knitting community and wrote a series of articles for Quillette magazine. And I remember how surprised people were that these so-called anti-racists could be so vicious. I think looking back, uh, what happened there was a precursor to what has happened since. Do you agree that we often what we often call wokeness has become mainstream? And how did this ha- happen so fast? It seems like we're moving towards some kind of totalitarianism or even socialism or communism, but many still fail to see what's happening. Here in Norway, for example, the media, the mainstream political parties, including the mainstream right, all hail Kamala Harris as a wonderful, strong and capable woman. Um, you've highlighted that she's in fact pretty left wing, even going as far as saying she's communist. Can you explain what you mean by that? Is she someone to be feared? And do you think she has a fair chance of being elected? Well, there's a there's a lot there. I do think that woke has mainstreamed. I don't know exactly what the condition uh, in in Norway would be as far as how that goes, but I'm sure that at least some elements of the theory have be become very prominent there. I can guess that without having been there, because it's everywhere. Uh, it's it's literally in. I mean. I was I was recently in London um, about a year ago. I was in London and we were talking with people from all over the world at this at Jordan Peterson's ARC conference. And there was a uh, fellow there from Kenya saying that this stuff is happening in Kenya. So if it's happening in Kenya, I can assume it's happening in Norway. Uh, I would assume that Norway, less than uh, your neighbors like Sweden, uh, are getting hit pretty hard with the immigration issue, and that that's getting tied into you know what they would call discourses of race and and bigotry and all of this. Um, It's very likely that the LGBT issue is also prominent there. Uh, I doubt that you've imported American critical race theory kind of on its face, although the UK tried and it failed. It certainly has mainstreamed though. In fact, uh, the question, one of the parts of your question was, how did this happen so fast? And the, the fact is that what I've learned in the intervening time since we met you know, about five years ago is that it didn't happen very fast. Uh, we saw it come out into the public very fast, but it's actually been been a roughly 50 year project uh, that really began in earnest in the late 1960s or early 1970s. And it started to infect our university systems uh, very deliberately. There was an attempted kind of cultural revolution almost in the West, uh, Paris and in the United States in particular, sticking out in, in 1968. And it didn't really 
do anything. It didn't work. Um, it was pushed back. The population didn't want to have this. And uh, by 19, 1969 or so, it fell apart. Of course, I'm in, in Paris, I'm referring to the famous May 1968 riots. There were riots all over the United States. And this was really critical theory attempting to take uh, take hold and transform society. And what happened when it didn't work was that they decided that they had to take a different approach. The direct approach wasn't going to work. Direct action, as they call it in Marxist literature, wouldn't would not succeed. And what would succeed, however, is to take up the strategy that was called the long march through the institutions. And they understood that going into education at all levels gave them access to the professional class in every domain. And so they started by going into the colleges. It took them about from from the late 1960s or 1970 as a bookmark, it took them about 15 years to actually figure out how to penetrate the colleges of education. Uh, for example, it took them probably less to start creating these you know, offshoots from English departments that would be African American studies or feminist studies or, or um, women's studies, gender studies. Uh, these things all kind of began in the 1960s in different places in the world. Women's studies started in Australia, for example, uh, and they they slowly started to build out a reservoir of activists within the university and to use those. This is what, what Marxists would call a technique of entryism. You enter into an institution and then transform it from within to be suitable to your needs uh, and slowly started to transform the university to produce um, their uh, people with their ideology. And that ideology has been three or three or four generations, depending on how we count generations, brewing in our, our university systems and leaking out into the, pop, uh, the public population. So when we get to years like 2015 is very notable. Um, actually, 2011 is probably the first notable year of, of what we would look at now and say woke that happened with the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York and across the U.S. particularly. It got um, broken up by being turned woke. Woke activists infiltrated and made everything about race and the focus on the banks uh, kind of fell out of the picture because everybody was arguing about race instead. And then it took um, in 2015 was when Black Lives Matter kind of burst onto the scene in the U.S. Uh, following the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown and, and Ferguson, Missouri, and then which is part of St. Louis for people who don't know where that is. It's a big it's kind of a dirty part of town in a big city. And then um, since 2019, 2020, especially 2020, they've kind of gone full bore. There was a full, uh, a full mass line launched in 2020 with the death of George Floyd across the entire Western world. And so it appears that this happened very fast, but there were 50 years of preparations enabling this to go mainstream very quickly. And of course, at, in 2020, we still had most every reason to believe the media. So when the media started to portray all of these things as racial uh, injustice, a lot of us believed it. We weren't ready to to, to see through the fact that the media might be telling us um, misleading stories about what's actually happening, trying to inflame tensions. I do think it's Marxist. I, can, you know, I was dedicated the last maybe five to six years of my life studying the roots of this, and I'm, I think it's unambiguously Marxist. Of course, it has elements drawn from fascism that it's using the corporations as a, as a major, major leverage tool. It's using big finance as its primary mechanism to create a cartel environment uh, where the governments and the in the the banking industry and the corporations are therefore working together, which is a more fascist model. Not that totalitarian power cares how it gets totalitarian power. It doesn't matter if it's you know pure communism. I was just reading a, a Chinese communist last night, Deng Xiaoping, who was who took power after Mao Zedong died in the 1970s. And Deng Xiaoping had this whole idea. His his fa most famous statement is, "It doesn't matter if the cat is black." black or white as long as it catches mice. And then his program was called Open Up. So they were going to now, even though China was going to be a, um, a, a communist country, they were going to have an ideologically impure, they were going to, they were going to put, put aside ideological dogmatism to Marxism and make it work. They were going to substitute pragmatism. So making communism work in the West requires making it through the corporations, which took up this woke stuff as early as 2011 and has only kind of snowballed ever since. Mm -hmm. Kamala Harris, you asked about, I think is the face of this, but I think that she says so many things that are kind of textbook Marxist 
and her parents were Marxists. Uh, her father was a Marxist professor, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. that it's it's a, it's a stretch for me to believe that she doesn't know what she's saying. I mean, I know yeah. that the American right likes to believe she's too stupid to understand what she's saying, but I don't buy it. She was a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor, I should say, um, in California. She was attorney general of California. She's not a moron. Um, and if you listen to her talk back then in particular, when she wasn't kind of doing this act that she does on camera now, it was very clear that she was extraordinarily sharp. And so I don't buy for a minute that she doesn't know what she's talking about. And I think she's hiding Marxism mm -hmm. in kind of this ditzy, giggly, um, yeah. you know, per act that she portrays. So I think she's very dangerous. Can you explain a bit by what you mean when you've been, hi you've been highlighting um, what she said about um, being unburdened, but by what has been, You've highlighted yeah. this and saying this isn't nonsense. This is actually communist propaganda. Can you just explain a bit by what she, what she means by by that? Yeah. So it turns out that I've gone viral on the internet a number of times for this. I made a thread that went extremely viral about this on Twitter. Um, many millions of views. And then I sat down and uh, with Charlie Kirk from Turning Point USA recently at, a, at an event uh, for Christians. And he asked me about it. And I walked through why it's Marxist. And um, that clip, the, at least a piece of it, a very short introduction piece has gone extremely viral. So I, I can I can articulate this pretty well. Uh, the the saying is that we want to be able to be uh, able to see what can be unburdened by what has been. But this is just kind of a modern, watered down rearticulation. In fact, I think this is the core of communism, by the way. Uh, it, everybody thinks it's this economic program of seizing the means of production or whatever. But um, what this is is it's a it's a repeat. In in the in Marx wrote pretty early on in the eighteen early eighteen fifties. He wrote something called. Uh, his um, 18th Brumaire to, to Louis Bonaparte. So this is going to be Napoleon III, and he's kind of mocking this guy who's going to take the crown of France, saying that he's kind of weak. He's a kind of a farce compared to his um, his, his predecessor, Napoleon I, and, you know, who was in a sense kind of a proto-fascist dictator. And so you have this this thing. And he says that, you know, men make their own history. This is a Marxist belief. Where did man come from? Man made himself. That's the core Marxist belief. That's from his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. That's the famous opium of the masses piece. And he mm -hmm. says men make their own history here in Louis, uh, in the, in the Brumaire of uh, Louis Bonaparte. He says men make their own history, but they don't make it as they please. They make it according to the conditions of history that are handed down to them in the legacy of all of the past generations weighs on the minds of the living like a nightmare. And so <clears throat> you can easily see that that is him saying people make their own history. They can make history however they want it to be, but they make it according to the burdens of what has been. It's extraordinarily clear that that's what his point is. Um, and so the point of communism is that essentially human beings have two choices. They can continue along kind of mindlessly sleepwalking, repeating what has been from one generation to the next with only small changes, or they can awaken to a socialist vision for the world and they can see what could be. Um, the Herbert Marcuse, the famous uh, leftist Marxist of the 1960s in, in, in the United States, member of the Frankfurt School, the father of the new left, frequently talked about it as he called it the concrete alternative. And he was very vague about what the concrete alternative looks like. But he was talking about being able to see, at least in your imagination, a different, a fundamentally different world that has gone through what he called a qualitative change compared to what has been, that we're not merely repeating what has been. And I don't know how many examples I could give you, um, whether it's from the queer theory literature on the front end, whether it's from Marx on the back end, whether it's from people in between. I could give you countless examples of that same sentiment being repeated again and again and again. Like I said, I think it's the core of the communist message is that we are born into a society <clears throat> that society is defined by its historical conditions. That's what Marx called this. And people are therefore defined by the historical conditions they're born into. And they have a choice either to follow with that or break from it. And to break from it requires them to be able to envision or imagine a fundamentally different world. Yeah, but what I'm just astounded by is that um, 
the mainstream and even the mainstream right doesn't really understand this and they are falling for this uh, without any questions, especially I think here in Norway, but also in, in Britain. I mean, we're just hailing Kamala Harris as a moderate, you know, just a very capable woman um, uh, when she's actually, she's got these very radical ideas. And um, how do we break, how do we actually convey this message? I mean, you're doing your bit, obviously, and we're trying to do our bit here at Document as well. Um, but will this just has, have to run its course or, and also when it comes to wokeness in general, have we reached peak woke now or, or is this just the beginning of a long period of, of wokery being, uh, uh, infiltrated in the mainstream culture and this is how it's going to be for a while? Well, um, those are difficult questions. I, the breaking through about Kamala is slightly easier. Um, and her new, newly chosen running mate, Tim Walls, who is the uh, governor of Minnesota, which, by the way, Minnesota is, if you look at the history, Minnesota is probably the most leftist state in the United States. Everybody thinks it's California or Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But the Communist Party USA was founded in Minnesota in <laughs> 1919, uh, you know, just after the, the Russian revolution and so i mean it, it it's it was the only state in 1984 that didn't vote for ronald reagan um the, the only blue spot on 49 states voted for uh for ronald reagan and one state didn't and um it's 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 a bastion of far left activity and tim waltz is absolutely in line with that but the easiest way to break through on this was for one or both of them because they actually work in, in tandem in, in, in a lot of ways is to actually show the evidence that her her record has been extremely radical whatever she's been portrayed as mostly she's hidden you know she was famously you know named by the media as the borders are after being given some kind of uh, responsibility for the american southern border uh, to about three years ago. And then the, the joke was that she never even went. She never showed up. She never went to the border. She went on TV and said, well, I've been to Europe. And like somehow this was somehow some point that she was made. And like it didn't make any sense. And the, the strategy has always been just to keep her out of the public eye, to keep her out of visibility so that you don't really know. But there's countless videos of her saying not just this kind of, you know, unburdened by what has been gobbledygook sounding silly stuff, but her saying very radical things. Everybody should be more woke. There's a video of her going around saying that and she's laughing hysterically that it doesn't matter if you're woke or woker or woke ass, you have to be just be woke, be more woke. You know, there's videos of, of her talking about virtually every radical program that you could possibly imagine, you, you know, saying that, you know, illegal immigrants aren't committing any crimes, they shouldn't be treated as criminals. I mean, it's just one thing after another. So showing people what she's actually said and then connecting that to a record actually does break through, especially now that she, I don't know why she's picked the most, one of the most radical governors in the country mm -hmm. um, as her running mate, but Tim Waltz is there, you know, writing on the ground in, in Minneapolis when George Floyd died, you know, pretending or maybe actually crying over it. I don't know. And um, just w allowed Minneapolis to burn. I mean, the, the Babylon Bee put out a fantastic joke the other day and it said something to the effect of, or yesterday, I guess, it, that, you know, Tim Waltz can make America more like Minneapolis or something like that with a picture of Minneapolis on fire. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there is a breakthrough possible. In fact, I think this is the greatest opportunity to break through and show that the Democratic Party is highly infiltrated with Marxist and profound leftism that we've had yet. So I'm actually optimistic with the regard to the to the Kamala Waltz pick here to be able to expose that for people. And as for peak woke, there's kind of two difficult, uh, three, maybe, there's a, a bunch of difficult points to raise. I don't mean to make this complicated. First of all, peak woke where, right? Because it, you, you kind of go through this woke phase. Like it, let's say that woke is going to end. Let's just pretend that that's the circumstance. You still go through this wave of it, right? And so maybe the UK is going to have a bigger wave, or maybe the United States is going to have the biggest wave, or maybe it's Canada, I don't know. And it started in maybe 2015. And so we're at different places in different sized waves, if that makes sense. I don't know that the wave in Norway will be huge. Uh, when I've been on uh, continental Europe, at least, I know that the, the gender and sexuality stuff, that people just kind of stare at it in, in dismay. They're not interested in this. So I doubt it'll get as crazy as it got in the United States and Canada. Um, there's also the, besides this, you know, where, where are we talking about and how bad will it be and what shape will it take? Um, 
there's also the fact that uh, there are there's this very, very clear split between the institutions of our societies, which are increasingly out of touch, and the the people. So the and this this kind of wave thing that I said applies in both cases, right? So in the United States, our media are still, or all of our institutions are still extremely woke, and they seem to be getting more woke. I don't think they're going to stop increasing how woke they are. So they have not hit peak woke, but the population is done with it. The normal the people don't like it almost anywhere. You, you, you just can't find it. People are just sick and tired of it. And I've noticed, at least in Western Canada, similar attitudes, or I should say in Alberta, because British Columbia is extremely woke still. And so the, the dependency on place is, is just tremendous. But in the U.S., you know, in most of the states, most people are, are fed up with woke. And so peak woke in terms of what the public will stomach, I think, has already passed. And I think that the UK and parts of Canada are hitting that point. So um, I don't know what happens. We have, in a sense, almost a zombie ideology where the thing is dying with, you know, as far as a as a bottom up grassroots kind of you know, movement, but the institutions are still pouring it out. It's almost like they have like a, like a flamethrower. The institutions are like a, a woke flamethrower and they've already burned all the grass in the, in all the trees or whatever in the United States, but they're still shooting fire at the charred earth. And it's not clear what they're accomplishing at that point, except making people mad. So I don't know what peak woke looks like. I think that the reason that so many people are still so woke is because the institutions are driving it so hard. We're seeing in the United States, at least, a tremendous split in the young people, men and women under the age of 25, I think 15 to 25. The women are actually increasingly left like the most left they've ever been. And it seems to be accelerating. The young men, on the other hand, are the most conservative generation since World War II. And they seem to be accelerating in the other direction, which is a really interesting dynamic and a concern because this, you know, speaks to the problem that it's also that woke as an ideology is targeting different people with different sensibilities in different ways. But um, I'm generally hopeful that young men aren't going to really put up with woke and that the young women will probably follow along. There's a fear, of course, that it'll just drive a wedge between them. But I don't know what peak woke even would look like mm -hmm. or how to measure if we're there. But I yeah. can tell you that I can say things and everybody I know says things out loud in public that they wouldn't dare say three years ago. Yeah. And so something has changed. Something's changed, definitely. And I think you're very right about women being more left wing and more woke than men. Um, let's talk a little bit about your latest book, The Queering of the American Child with uh, Logan Lansing. Um, talking of uh, woke in Norway, I think uh, it's the queer agenda that's very prominent here. And it's it's such a scary read. I've been listening to you uh, whilst driving around the mountains in Norway. Um, and uh, so much is true, both in the UK and here in Norway. You know, Norway is one of the most liberal countries um, in the world, really, where a child uh, age six can go and change their legal gender with just one parent present. So it's gone very, very far here already. And But I know that many Norwegian parents are starting to worry about the extent of gender ideology and queer theory in the children's schools and kindergartens. So uh, I think there might, I'm sensing that people are starting to have enough here as well. Um, is there any hope of reversing this? Um, I have teenage children and I sense that there might be a backlash coming, a kind of rebellion against the mainstream culture and what the teachers are preaching. Um, what are your impressions? Um, you, you mentioned a little bit that people are actually getting fed up with with the gender stuff um, already. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of reasons for hope. And I don't know exactly what's going on. I mean, with that one that, that one example you've given, I've now heard what's going on in Norway, but it, there's an interesting situation right now. I think there's more hope in this particular domain than most of the others, certainly more than there is in immigration. Immigration will be much more complicated and I think is going to be the basis for a great deal of conflict across basically every Western country, um, with maybe the exception of Australia, I don't know. But uh, certainly the United States, Canada, and all of Europe are feeling that pinch in a very um, acute way. And we see what's breaking out, you know, on the ground 
ground in the UK and in France over this. I'm sure that will spread uh, across Europe. And I think we'll see similar in Canada and the United States. And it, it, it could get quite dangerous. But there's a lot of hope here. Um, so the transgender phenomenon, which is kind of this shiny object at the point of the gender ideology more broadly um, is is regulated, at least in the medical department, by an organization called WPATH, which is called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And WPATH has not had a very good year uh, or two years. It's falling apart. Its membership is down by incredible percentages. I don't remember if it's down by two thirds, but it may be. Um, it's been brought under tremendous scrutiny. It's likely that WPATH is on the way out. We also have, uh, I mean, just because of the sheer numbers of scandals that are coming out around it, the fact that it's being proved to be, you know, an activist agenda driven, pretending to be a medical association, the fact that the internal communications show that they know that they're doing harm, but they're going to plow ahead anyway, that they're blind to the fact of comorbid psychiatric disorders that are actually the ultimate cause of the gender discomfort that some of the kids are feeling and they just don't care this is like put them on drugs and surgery you know and it's mm -hmm. this is all very bad for this entire transgender medicine phenomenon which all of queer theory is damaging but at least you don't end up with the physical destruction of of children if that falls apart and so there's a lot of hope there. And a lot of parents are actually, they're, they're understanding that they're being asked to tolerate something that is genuinely intolerable. And there is this movement, and it's not necessarily, you know, a backlash, but there's this movement to protect children that's arising all over the world uh, with people linking arms very quickly. You know, that they were going around playing the Pink Floyd song, Leave Our Kids Alone uh, in Canada and made a movement of millions of parents. And, and you know, Canada is not population-wise a huge country. Uh, and they had millions of parents marching, you know, and the kind of theme song was leave our kids alone. And it's become a big international movement. So I think people are awakening to the fact that gender ideology itself, is, which is just a facet of queer theory, is actually an extraordinarily uh, dangerous ideology. And it's totally inappropriate for children who are not... Uh, I guess, cognitively developed enough to understand, I mean, just to put it more directly, children are forming their concrete understanding of the world, their brains are developing to be able to reason out categories. And this gender ideology and queer theory comes in and confuses that at the most basic level, which mm -hmm. disorders the child's upbringing and parents are starting to recognize and this and start to put it together. And like I said, we're in this position where we have information out about it. It's not just WPATH falling apart, but like, you know, the book that Logan and I published, The Queering of the American Child. There are lots of other books coming out about what, you know, Al Abigail Schreier's put out a, a book about it very famously. Um, it, the, it, there's just so irreversible damage is what that book was called. There's so much coming out that shows what's really going on under the hood. And gender ideology needs to be understood as a completely detached, unreal uh, interpretation of the world that seeks openly in its own words, seeks openly to radicalize children. Um, in fact, one of the examples that I almost gave you a minute ago about, you know, able to see what can be unburdened by what has been, there's a there's a queer theorist we quote in the book named Munoz, uh, Jose Esteban Munoz, who says, that queerness is not yet here. And he describes it as this kind of a horizon, we may never even touch queer. But it's, you know, this imaginary vision that they have out on the distance. So it's the ability to, to see what can be unburdened by what has been. And then there's another uh, educator who wrote a paper in 2002 titled Against Repetition. His name is Kevin Kumashiro. And Kevin Kumashiro's argument was that what you do with queer theory to prevent the repetition of society from one generation to the next, again, unburdened uh, by what has been, uh, what you do is you actually, he says in his own words, is that teachers have a responsibility to lead children into an emotional crisis using things like queer theory so that you can then structure the environment around them so they resolve that crisis productively. And I don't think there's yeah. a parent alive that wants to send their children to school to be driven into emotional crisis yeah. so that activists can, can interpret that crisis for them. But this is what queer yeah. theory feels entitled to do. So there's this is 
the, the reckoning on this is coming. And I think that it's going to be the easiest and clearest domain of woke to fight back against. And yeah. maybe Norway is fair, fairly lucky because like the UK with the CAS report, the WPATH mm-hmm. stuff falling apart, they may not get caught in the the huge medical disaster that the United States and Canada are facing where thousands of our children yeah. are being are injured by this. Yeah, you're, cor- you're correct about that because I think medically we haven't gone as far haven't been as liberal with medical treatments here in Scandinavia and possibly Britain as as in the US. Um, and they're rowing back on on treatment now for teenagers. So that's really good news. Um, can we just jump a little bit back to uh, politics and just talk a little bit about what's happening in Britain? Because it's been quite shocking uh, last few uh, 10 days or so uh, with uh, what happened there with the stabbing of the three young girls, well, more than that, but the deaths of three, three, I think now, um, young girls. Um, and then the fo- following that, uh, riots breaking out everywhere. And um, it's been interesting to see the response of Britain's new prime minister, Keir Starmer, because um, he's coming across as quite an authoritarian. Um, his response, it, he, he He fails to mention also that Muslims are also intimidating and committing violence. So he's being very selective in his outrage. uh, And he's being accused of ignoring and excusing them and coming really hard down on white Brits, which I don't think is helping the situation. Is this a kind of British version of critical race theory where we say immigrants can do no wrong? um, And all this talk about Islamophobia. uh, So we're expecting now, I think, uh, a clampdown even further on free speech in the UK. Um, what do you th- how do you think he's thinking? Is this his English socialism playing out? The Ingsoc that you've been mentioning on, on, on X, for example? Um, yeah. Yeah, and his, the Fabian Society. How do you explain his response? Yeah, there's a lot to, to say about this, actually. And I'm glad you brought up the Ingsoc Fabian Society part. I think that the British population and actually all of us are long overdue for a conversation about the Fabian Society, the Fabian Socialists, um, which was established in London in 1884, uh, primarily by George Bernard Shaw and Sidney and Beatrice Webb and a handful of others. And it, it is it is what so the Fabian Society tried to recruit George Orwell again and again and again, and George Orwell wouldn't go along. He didn't like them. He thought they were terrifying. And so he imagined them spending a century from 1884 till 1984 gaining the power of Stalin and creating a total surveillance and totalitarian state like was happening in the USSR uh, under Stalin. He published this book in 1948. Stalin died in 1953. So this was during the kind of height of Stalin's power. Power that he's envisioning this and he writes this warning to the world about without ever actually naming them maybe that's the problem without ever uh, but the warning is about the fabian society and so um fortunately i put out a video you know you said is this like critical race theory i made a video for prager U that just came out a couple of weeks ago that's called it's about critical immigration theory so if you go to their website the prager U page you can see what i called critical immigration theory and it came out and i thought i would hear from a lot of americans because i usually do prager U is a very kind of american phenomenon and i have been flooded with british responses to, I mean, I've had so many British people, this is exactly what's happening in our country. You've put your finger exactly on it. This is perfect. I said it in American terms for PragerU, obviously, but the British are very easy, very able to translate it very quickly. And so what I see is actually a strategy. So um, I I very much like that the the name that Keir Starmer has received is two-tier Keir, um, Mm -hmm. because he is doing two-tier policing here. He's got a two-tier society where in effect, because of the critical immigration theory, which is like critical race theory, that the oppressed minority can do no wrong, even if they're a numerical major- majority, it's a historical minority, can do no wrong. He's created an absolutely nakedly two-tier society with two-tier policing, and he's encouraging that. Um, now, the Fabians are not Marxists, but this is this is an echo. They're, they're cousins, but they're not Marxists. They don't actually believe in revolution. They're an anti-revolutionary socialist program that still aims to achieve communism, but by completely different means, which is why Orwell called them English socialism or Ingsoc. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said that he was a communist. Or he's on fire for communism, for example, at one point in his life. But 
he preferred if it had more English methods. And so this is kind of what you have going on. And so I bring that up because Herbert Marcuse, very famously, this is the neo-Marxist I commented on uh, earlier, the most famous of the neo-Marxists, the most radical of the 1960s. Um, he, he wrote an essay in 1965 called Repressive Tolerance, where he makes the case that there needs to be a two-tier system that supports the agendas from the left and that silences and squashes the agendas from the right. He says, in fact, that, that what you need, he says that our society has a false form of tolerance called repressive tolerance. And the answer to that would be a, a true form of tolerance called liberating tolerance. And in the essay, in his own words exactly, he defines liberating tolerance as extending tolerance to movements from the left and withdrawing tolerance from movements to the right, including in word, act, and deed. And so that means that there's a definite two-tier pro-leftist agenda program that it will stamp on anything it considers right. He says that it would it's imperative to, and this is going to ring very true for what the British are experiencing right now, um, there's an imperative to prevent the idea from ever entering the minds of the right-wing person, which requires, he says, not just censorship, but something he calls pre-censorship. Mm. So that it's very Orwellian at that point. And I don't exactly, he never defines pre-censorship, but he just says that it's absolutely necessary. So the idea is that the thought is never to enter your mind. Well, I saw, I don't know if it's verified or not, but I saw a thing going around on social media last night suggesting that the British government may consider trying to label foreign actors on social media as terrorists if they're so-called fanning the flames of what's going on. But that's a obvious attempt to do pre-censorship and to prevent the idea from ever entering the mind of the of the right wing. And so this is obviously what he's playing out. I think at this point, because the Marxist agenda and the Fabian agenda operate through generating productive conflict. And by productive, I mean the kind of conflict that they can use to put forth favored policies for themselves. I think that what's happening is that he is coming out as authoritarian as he is and creating this very nakedly two-tiered uh, program as not because of his ideology, uh, just being this, um, you know, pro immigrant, anti native population kind of position, that, but specifically to provoke the native population to do more riots, to become more angry, so that he can then pass legislation or push legislation that will then put more social control. And so this is this is a very scary time for Britain. I think that you are in the process of watching Big Brother be born in the UK right now. Um, and I think that Keir Starmer is actually very deliberately provoking the conditions that will allow it to happen. Wow, that's really scary stuff, actually. And um, yeah, I share your concern with what's going on in, in, in Britain. Um, just quickly, moving back to the US, um, what is your opinion on J.D. Vance? Um, and how do you see the Republican Party's future? Well, I'm I'm a little, little torn on J.D. Vance. Um, I generally like a great deal of what he says. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned, as many people have raised uh, issues with with his connections to sort of the scary surveillance side of the big tech apparatus. I understand that J.D. Vance has been fairly consistently philosophically something called post-liberal um, all the way back to his undergraduate days. And it's one of one of the positions he's been most consistent on that he may in fact be a, a philosophically a Straussian, which means to follow the philosophies of Leo Strauss, who's another, he's a Leo Strauss is kind of this kind of arch conservative character, but he's still in this Hegelian mold of society transforming itself through kind of a process of alchemy. And so I do have a handful of concerns about J.D. Vance, but they're not more severe than my concerns would have been about Mike Pence the last time Trump was president. And so I feel like it's important to be, you know, forthright and ask him tough questions and get that all on the out on the record and see so that, you know, it's not happening under, underneath the radar, but, you know, where we can't see that he's maybe trying to facilitate Palantir to in, create a, a mass surveillance state or data yeah. state uh, across the United States or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, um, his positions seem to be fairly strong. It, uh, I hear him talk about the issues, um, especially the culture war issues, with a clarity that, 
I think only a man of his generation, uh, I don't know if I might brag, my generation might do okay with it too. But, you know, these older, these boomers are not talking very well about the culture war issue, frankly, but these younger people are. And so he's bringing that clarity to the, to the, to the ticket. And so I don't think he's an enthusiastic pick, but I don't know who would have been a more enthusiastic pick. Um, the claims that he's a, a dead weight or even a problem for the ticket, I think, are are overblown. I think that was just kind of a, a media wave that came and is almost crested. And I think it's going to turn to the advantage of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there there is going to be some of this energy is going to infiltrate the Republican Party and the Make America Great Again movement regardless. And I think that that's going to be a challenge for those of us who um, think that individual liberty is what the United States was founded on and the, the key virtue that we should be uh, organizing our society around. But it's not a, you know, it's not a it's not the end of the world. I don't think it's going to be, you know, written in stone that now we're going into this new world where we're going to have right wing authoritarianism instead of left wing because the vice president who Trump doesn't agree with any of that. So uh -huh. uh, the vice president um, has these views. Um, I don't know that he's an uh, inspiring enough candidate to be able to become president on the wake of Donald Trump. I mean, four years is a lot of time. Uh, supposing even that they, they take office. So it's hard to say, but um, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan, but I'm, I'm generally warm to him with concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's useful. Thank you. Um, uh, what's next for you? Is there anything that you're working on right now that you think you want to delve more deeply into? Well, I mean, I'll just mention, uh, I don't know that it's, it's much, f I am technically working on a million things and finishing none of them. Uh, mostly what's next for me is lots of travel kind of all over the world to, to speak and present and whatever else. But um, what I'm working on at the moment that's got me very busy is uh, this coming weekend, I'm doing a workshop in Dallas, Texas where I'm going to try to lay out, it turns out I didn't give myself enough time, so I'm quite stressed out about it, but I want to lay out the history of the evolution of communism, which isn't to say to talk about what happened in, you know, kind of on the ground politically or economically or socially in communist countries over time, but actually to talk about how the ideas have changed. So you can go all the way back, not just to Marx, but to before Marx, to to the, the French character Babouf, for example, who is considered to be the first communist. Um, and, and look at how the philosophy of communism uh, has changed through time. And, uh, you know, from him to Marx, from Marx to uh, Lenin, really being the next major character in the development, then mm -hmm. the whole development in the in the Eastern what well, it's called Eastern communism. So Soviet Union, China, the Eastern Bloc, uh, some of their satellites they created like Cuba to a degree. Um, and then also the Western Marxism developed on another track. And then these kind of come together. And the, the big question that I'm trying to answer for people and to put together even totally for myself is how in the world in the West or actually all over the world in, in China as well, how in the world do we have a communism that's coming to the people through corporations, mm -hmm. which seems to be actually completely impossible. It seems like the opposite of what communism would do. But like I said before, the goal, uh, what I want to do is I want to portray the, the goal of communism has always just been to take power. It, it's to advance its own vision for the world. And it doesn't, at the end of the day, particularly care too much um, how it does that. That's why I was reading Deng Xiaoping last night and reading that Deng Xiaoping had decided that we need to take a different model, uh, communists need to take a different model uh, where they, I'm not a communist, just to be clear, but communists need to take a different model where they are open to utilizing the productive forces of the market, um, but kind of in a contained manner. So they control the market and they have all kinds of bogus theory to get around how it's still communist. They say for in China, for example, you can own a huge company, you can own all the capital assets for that company, but you can't own the land and you can't own the raw materials because that would be bourgeois. So the state has to own all the land and all the raw materials, but you get to do what you will do and make as much money as you want in order to um, unleash the productive forces to the glory of communism. And I think that this model has actually successfully obviously put China in a position to become a world superpower in this century, which is horrifying. And that the we're in a situation where the West has decided to use that circumstance to copy the model and try to impose it on its citizens as well. And because as 
Calvin Coolidge said, the business of America is business. Um, of course, it has to come through communism. So I'm putting together this workshop to try to tell that story. And I think I'm going to try to develop that story as as clearly as possible. I don't know if it'll turn into a book or not, um, but I've written quite a lot of things that I've never quite finished about gender ideology, about um Mao Zedong and the relevance of, of his his revolutions to the, the revolution happening in the West mm -hmm. uh, about political warfare. I've got a million topics that I'm working on and never quite nailing down the end of. Uh, so hopefully we'll see a huge burst of productivity where lots of these things kind of come together at the same time and, and a lot yeah. of things come out at once. Yeah, well, that sounds really exciting. And I'll, I'll keep following you on, on X and see wherever you pop up. Um, make sure to follow you um, and on new discourses on your own podcast, of course, as well. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. And so I just want to thank you so much for your time and for sharing your brilliant insights with me and also with uh, Documents viewers. So thank you so much, James. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.